Praise the Lord, church, this morning. Uh, greetings to each one of you in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Um, as you all know, we are still continuing in, with the series on the books of the apostles, uh, Acts of the Apostles. And we are in Acts chapter 5 still. We're squeezing every verse out of chapter 5. Uh, we're on Acts chapter 5, 40 to 42 this morning. And I'll start with verse 40. And when they had called into the apostles, they beat them and charged them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. Then they left the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name. And every day in the temple and from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching that the Christ is Jesus. If we were to look at our life from birth to death, our whole life journey in a very natural sense is to somehow be counted worthy. We want to be counted worthy of our parents' love or our relatives' love or our peers' love. And we also want to be counted worthy of respect, right, or admiration by those who we work with or those we interact with. And sometimes we go to any extent to earn this worth in overt ways or covert ways. And all of us have to deal with this innate drive to chase after worthiness. But in the passage in which we just read, the disciples left the presence of the council after getting beaten. The punishment of the Sanhedrin, as we know, for breaking the law is 39 lashes. Just imagine the disciples feeling the sting of pain on their back. Just having just received those 39 lashes or beatings. It was not just a physical sting, but you could also imagine there was a mental sting as well. They were disrespected, they were dishonored, they were violated, but they did not leave feeling like victims. They didn't have a pity party. They didn't have a news conference. They left rejoicing because they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name of Jesus. At face value, this seems very strange. Typically, you're counted worthy to suffer if you do something wrong, right? You sow what you, uh, you reap what you sow, right? Isn't that what we say? But these disciples were obeying the Great Commission. And not only that, they obey, they're obeying the, the command of the angel that set them out free from the prison. To say, and they, the angel told them to go and preach the words of this life. And all they received in return were beatings. And perhaps when they were feeling the sting of pain in the back, the disciples may have remembered the words of Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. And we covered this a couple years ago. And Jesus said this, Matthew 5, 11, Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. They rejoiced because they just experienced what Jesus prepared them for. They remembered that the suffering, that remember that suffering, dishonor for his name would result in uh, heavenly rewards. And not only that, they were joining along with a long list of prophets who were persecuted for being the mouthpiece of God. They realized there was something unique and special about being picked to suffer for Jesus. In Hebrews chapter 11, we know this is the faith chapter, right? It ends on a sobering note. What does the author of Hebrews say? Hebrews 11, 35 to 38. Some were tortured, refused to accept release so that they may rise again to a better life. Others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned and they were saw in two. They were killed with the sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, afflicted, and mistreated. And this is the key words. Of whom the world was not worthy. Wandering about in deserts and mountains, in dens and caves of the earth. Let me ask us a question. Why do we demand a place in this world? Why do we demand for rights and chase after political and social power? It's because we want the world to recognize us. It's because we want the world to know that we deserve to be here. That we are worthy 
to be here. But look at what the author of Hebrews says. That these people were tortured and suffered, mocking and flogging and stoned and sawed in two. They were poor and destitute and mistreated for the sake of Jesus. The faith in God was so precious that this world did not deserve them. They ignored all the privileges of this world and focused their eyes on the heavenly prize. They found eternity more valuable and lasting than the temporal benefits of social and political power on this earth. You might think to yourself, you know, in a strange way, I kind of want to be persecuted, you know. I anticipate persecution, but I'm in the middle of the Bible Belt. This is Oklahoma we're talking about. And I'm surrounded by people who are more Christian than I am. It's true. I mean, I, if our calling is to stay in Oklahoma for the rest of our lives, where there are 10 churches in every square mile, square mile radius, I just made up that number, you might encounter you might not encounter persecution like the disciples and in the early church. But without me spelling it out, you know this. If you step out into certain social circles, even in Oklahoma, it looks vastly different than anything you have experienced in a church, youth group, or at, at home. And our parents, to their credit, did shield us quite a bit from this world. And they're still doing their best to help us grow in a healthy and safe environment and making sure that each one of us, each one of you, uh, become spiritually and mentally mature. So that when you face the world on your own, you'll be ready. You will know how to face the challenges to come. And there's a real pressure to conform to a certain way of thinking and living that is opposite to what we find in, in Scripture. And sometimes this pressure actually comes from within ourselves. Our flesh wars against us. It comes from others, of course, from the world, our peers, and also from the forces of darkness. The Christian life, and we hear this all the time, if the Christian life, if lived faithfully, is not an easy life. If lived faithfully. You can be a nominal Christian and go about your day. But if you want to live a faithful life, it's not an easy life. It is not a bed of roses. It's a life of constantly dying to ourselves. In the midst of a buffet line of sin. The choices galore. And each of those choices are calling out our name every day. So how can we experience dishonor for Christ in this nation, in this state that prides itself on being the beacon of religious liberty? Let me share with you some less than obvious ways we can experience dishonor. And then I will conclude with the most obvious way. And now let me list that out for you before I break it down. We can experience dishonor for being truth tellers. We can experience dishonor for being humble. We can experience dishonor for living a life of integrity. We can experience dishonor for proclaiming Christ. And let me go through these somewhat quickly. First, we can experience dishonor for Christ by being truth tellers. And when I say truth tellers, I don't just mean the truth of the gospel. I'll get there at the end. What I mean is that our conviction our conviction that God is a God of truth will transform us to tell the truth even if it hurts our reputation and standing. That's how extreme of a truth teller we'll become. There are times where you have done something wrong and you don't want to own up to your mistake. And then there are times where you have done nothing wrong personally, but telling the truth about something will cause us to be alienated or even punished. But what Christ does in us is this. Even if 99 of 100 people come forward and speak a lie to protect themselves, a genuine Christian will be that one person who will tell the truth, even if it means their life will be forever changed in a bad way. Even if it means they will suffer dishonor, their conviction to tell the truth because Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life will bring them greater rewards in heaven. We're, we live in a world where we're told that the end justifies the means. In other words, if the end result is what matters, how we get there doesn't. Even if we lie and cheat, all that matters is being prosperous. That's what the world tells us. 
And this lie is what causes many Christians to be utterly dishonest. It's sad to say that. All for the sake of escaping temporal dishonor and troubles, they forget what truly matters. They're willing to lie and cheat their way. But eternity matters. Jesus matters. Truth matters. And second, we can experience dishonor for being humble. This may not seem obvious, but you don't realize that humility can cause dishonor until you work with people who sense a little bit of humility in you and they think you're a doormat to be treated like dirt. Have you experienced this or am I by by myself? Some get pleasure in provoking people who just want to who just want to come to work or come to a school, a school or classroom just to respect others and, and to be peaceful and to put others first. Some like to pick and stab you on the name of trying to toughen you up. They're trying to do you a favor. They're trying to bully you into becoming more tough, so to speak. But they don't realize that the life of humility that we're trying to walk is not because we're naive. It's not because we're people pleasers, although all of us struggle with that to some extent. We're trying to follow Christ's example, right, in, in doing this, in putting others' interest before ours. And we know what they're trying to do. We're not, we're not dummies, right? And every fleshly instinct in us can take us to the edge of, of bursting in anger. You know, we're, we're sometimes in our flesh, it's hard, right? It's hard to walk. It's hard to walk that walk when you have somebody constantly, mentally even torturing you, right? But having, that fresh, always, having always a fresh perspective of the sufferings of Christ is key. He remained quiet when the soldiers mocked him and stripped him of his clothes and spat in his face and beat his head with a stick. Having this perspective to walk as Jesus walked can lead us to suffer dishonor for the sake of being humble. Thirdly, we can experience dishonor for living a life of integrity. We live in a time where living in integrity is a sign of weakness. What I mean by this is if we choose to do the right thing all the time, we're mocked for being goody-goody. Or we're accused of having a holier-than-thou attitude. Now, living in integrity is a vast topic, and I don't have a lot of time to cover all the facets of this. But, However, I want to cover one area in particular because we don't talk about it enough, and it's, it's very uncomfortable to talk about. Our conviction about sexual purity, that sex is a gift of God given to a husband and wife within the confines and covenant of marriage. That concept is is foreign to the world outside of this building. What are you talking about? They may respond. What kind of century do you live in? Are you even being realistic? These are the kind of questions that come, come towards us. And sometimes, and I've been there, we've been, we're forced to say, well, I'm Indian. <laughs> we don't do that stuff. I mean, if this, our conviction in this area is tied to our culture alone, I have, I have news for you. India is way worse in this area. And it has always been. It's just hidden, okay? In the Western world, it's in the light of the day. In India, it's in the darkness of night. And our conviction to live a life of sexual purity is not based on culture. It's not based on the fear of losing our reputation. It's based on our walk with Christ. And what is, what is the basis of this conviction? It's a trust in knowing that God knows what is best for me. God created me. God created sex. God has a purpose in everything, every gift that he has given. And he has given us this word. His word is a light to my feet and a light uh, to my path. Scripture tells me that I should flee from sexual immorality. Scripture tells me that there should not be a hint of sexual immorality. Scripture tells me that the marriage bed should be kept undefiled. And this is a difficult, difficult topic to cover because it comes with a lot of shame. But I think about Jesus' response to the adulterous woman in this instance. She was dragged by the people in front of Jesus, ready to be stoned to death. But Jesus' response changed her forever. Neither do I condemn you. 
Now go and sin no more. The one person who was worthy to stone her to death, to punish her because he was sinless, did not punish her, but instead he showed compassion. At the end of the day, it's our love for Christ in our hearts that helps us to live in integrity. Our choice to love Jesus over every temporal pleasure of sin is what helps us to walk in victory. And as we walk in victory, we're going to encounter dishonor from everyone around us for making the choice to honor Christ. And lastly, we can experience dishonor for proclaiming Christ. Uh, and I want to read from 1 Peter chapter 3, 13 to 17. And it's a familiar verse. Now who is there to harm you if you're zealous for doing what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. And this word, these set of verses encapsulates, encapsulates everything that we talked about. Even if you suffer for righteousness' sake, even if you suffer for telling the truth, even if you suffer for being humble, even if you suffer for living in integrity, as Peter said, you will be blessed. He goes on to say, he goes on to say in verse 15, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks of you for a reason, that, for the hope that is in you. There will come a time when somebody will notice your unbending conviction to always tell the truth, or, or they will see that you, your, your desire to live in humility or put other people's interests before yours, or they will see your desire to live a pure and holy life, and they will ask, why? What drives you to do this? In that moment, don't try to escape the question by saying, well, because I'm Indian. Or, or, or don't, I mean, don't just say that my parents taught me to live this way. But as Peter exhorts us, be prepared to give an answer for the hope that is in you. Give a reason why you love Jesus. What a great opportunity to talk about Jesus. Why you look forward to eternity. And why you had to die to yourself daily. People need to know the reason for the hope that is in you. Otherwise, they will think you're just a good person. There are many good people or in a different shades. They will no, have no idea that Jesus changed your life. And they will not know that this same Jesus can change their life. So even if you have to endure alienation or feel left out or looked down upon, share the gospel with people you know. Pray that the Holy Spirit will soften their heart to receive the gospel with an open heart. So suffering, dishonored is not limited just to third world countries. If you're called to live the rest of our life in a country like this where we enjoy religious freedom, we might not experience torture or beatings for being a Christian, but we can surely experience the suffering or dishonor for the sake of Christ in the choices we make to always tell the truth, to always be humble, to live a life of integrity, and to proclaim Jesus through our words and actions. And as the worship team comes up, let me read another verse for you. First Peter chapter 4, 12 honors, Peter, Peter says, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice, again that word, rejoice in so far as you share Christ's sufferings so that you may rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. Peter is speaking from his own experience. He is among one of those who were beaten 39 times, as we just read. And all he did was to obey, that, to proclaim the good news. And he exhorts us to rejoice. We get to share in Christ's sufferings. And we get to experience the glory that is to be real. We, there are heavenly rewards in store for us. So it is a cause to rejoice. If you are mocked and insulted for the name of Christ for any given reason, Peter says, you are blessed. Consider yourself being counted worthy for the privilege to suffer for Jesus. Do not see yourself as a victim. You've been called for it. 
And as the author of Hebrews says, Hebrews 13, as Jesus suffered outside the gate, let us go to him outside the camp and bear the reproach he endured. For we have no lasting city, and, but we seek the city that is to come. Hallelujah. Let us spend a moment of time in prayer. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lord, we look to you this morning, God. We remember, oh God, we are nothing but dust. But Lord, you saw something in us. You chose us. You picked us up out of the miry clay. You put us in a solid rock. You gave a new song in our mouth. You gave us salvation. You gave us the light of the gospel in our hearts. Lord, as we live in this world, Lord, it is hard sometimes, God. And we ask for the power of the Holy Spirit to transform us so that we can be truth tellers, that we can live a life of integrity, that we can be humble like Jesus was humble, that we can proclaim the powerful message of the gospel that will transform people's hearts. And if persecution, if suffering comes our way, if we are counterworthy for that, I pray, Lord, that you'll give us that boldness in our heart. Give us the confidence knowing that you are seeing it all. When we are persecuted, Jesus, you experience the pain. Help us to, Lord, help us to be counted worthy to suffer for your name. Hallelujah. We give you all the praise, glory, and honor of God. In Jesus' name we pray.